Greetings and welcome to a series of lectures on intermediate algebra, equations, and inequalities in one variable. This lecture focuses on unit analysis and scientific notation. All right, let's move on to unit analysis and scientific notation. <clears throat> unit analysis is just the process of analyzing a given problem using one unit of measure and translating it to another unit of measure. So for example, if I'm trying to make a recipe and um, I only have a quarter cup measure or a teaspoon and I need a cup, I need to figure out how many teaspoons are in a cup. Okay, it's just translating one unit of measure to the other. The conversion factor is that ratio, that information we need to know to be able to multiply one unit to the other to get it to translate properly. For example, there are three feet in one yard. So the ratio is three feet to one yard. Another example is mileage, miles. So one mile is 5,280 feet. So the conversion factor is one mile to 5,280 feet, or the other way of looking at it is 5,280 feet to one mile. Now it depends on what your problem is. Uh, if I'm going from feet to mile, I would use the one mile over 2, 000, uh, 5,280 uh, feet. If I have miles and I want to translate it over to feet, my conversion factor would then be 5,280 feet to one mile. Let's convert 6, uh, 65,000 feet to miles. What will that be in miles? So our 65,000 feet, we need to multiply it by our conversion factor. Now since I want to end up in miles, my miles better be up on top, and I want to get, get rid of the feet, so I need to get the feet down on the bottom. So 65,000 times 1, uh, all over 5,280. Now you can see the feet unit goes away. That's how you know you've done it correctly when the feet unit will cancel itself out because FT over FT is just still a big fat one. 65,000 over 5,280 mile will be about 12.3 miles. The first Ferris wheel was built in 1893. A rider on the Ferris wheel would travel approximately 39.3 feet per minute. Let's convert the 39.3 feet per minute to miles per hour. So not only do I need to, I mean, one way is to convert it separately, convert the feet to miles, convert the minute to hour, and then bring them together. The other is to do it all in one fell swoop. So let's try it the first way with doing it separately. So I just want to convert the 39.3 feet to what that would be in miles. So 39.3 feet to one mile is to 5,280 feet. The feet will cancel. I'm left with 39.3 over 5,280 miles. And you get the decimal approximation of that is 0.00744 blah blah blah. That's how many uh, 39.3 feet it's 0 0.007 miles. But I still have to deal with the time. It's per minute, so it's per one minute. So I need to convert minutes over to how many hours that would be. So one minute times, well, there are 60 minutes in an hour. I want to change it to hours, so hour better be on top. Minute will cancel out, and I'm left with 1 60th of an hour, or uh, 0.016666 bar, okay? Six repeats. And then I need to bring the two together. The 0 0.00744318188 mile all over the 0 0.01666 hour. It's approximately, if you do the math, plug it in the calculator or do it longhand, it's going to be 0 0.45 miles per hour. Now the other way of doing it is doing it together. If we do it together, we're going to change the feet to mile and the minute to hour. So there's going to be 
lots of crossing out. There's going to be several conversions. There's going to be at least two conversion factors all in one fell swoop. It's all multiplication, so it's okay. All right, 39 feet per one minute. I need to multiply it by, well, one mile per 5,280 feet times 60 minutes per one hour. Now, you might be wondering why. Why is this flipped? Well, because I need the hour to end up on bottom. I need my time to end up on bottom. The minute will cancel, and I'm left with hour on the bottom. It's per hour. Now I'm going to do the multiplication all in one step, and I still get 0 0.45 approximately miles per hour. In 1993, a ski resort in Vermont was said to have the world's fastest chairlift with the speed of 1,100 feet per second. Well, let's convert to miles per hour because we do have some sense of what, you know, 60 miles per hour feels like or what that is. Let's translate the feet per second to miles per hour. Now, I need to convert the feet to miles, so here's my distance conversion, one mile to 5,280 feet. I need to also convert my time from seconds to hours. But when I convert my time, I go through minutes, because unless I know specifically off the top of my head how many seconds in an, in an hour, I'm going to go through minutes first. So 60 seconds in a minute, then 60 minutes in an hour. The minutes will cancel, the seconds will cancel, and therefore hours are left. So I'm left with 1,100 times 1 times 60 times 60 miles are left. 1 times 5,280 times 1 times 1 hour is our units left. Do the conversion, I mean do the multiplication, and we get that it's 750 miles per hour this chairlift is. Do you think that's true? 750 miles per hour? Uh, I think you'd probably get whiplash, so I'm, I'm going with it's highly unlikely that it is true that this uh, chair, chair lift, ski lift, will go 1,100 feet per second. Now go ahead and try a population, uh, a problem on population change. So you're given the information of one birth every seven seconds, one death every 13 seconds. One international immigrant comes into the U.S. every 25 seconds. What is the average number of births per week? Now we know we have one birth every seven seconds. Okay, And then we're going to have to change those seconds into a week. What is the average number of immigrants per year? Well, we know the average per second. We're going to have to go through seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, and year to convert that time. So if we want to go from seconds to week, we have to go through seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to days, days to a week. If we want to go for, from seconds to a year, we have to go from seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to day, day to week, week to year. So we have quite a few conversions in there, but if we keep them all straight, we'll be okay. So let's take a look at what this would look like. All right, here are our time conversions. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week and approximately 52 weeks in a year. So if we want to know what's the average number of births, then let's convert one birth per seven seconds. We want to convert that over to minutes. So I have 60 births per seven minutes. Then I want to change that to hours. That's going to be 3,600 births per seven hours. Let's change that to days. So that's 3,600 times 24, which is 86,400 births per seven days. And there are seven days in a week, so the sevens cancel out and the days cancel out. That means 
there are 86,400 births per week. Now, let's check the other one, the average number of immigrants per year. One immigrant per 25 seconds. So that's one, that, that would be one immigrant, 25 seconds. We need to see what it is per minute. That is 60 immigrants per 25 minutes. Let's get it in form of hours. That is 3,600 immigrants per 25 hours. So approximately 3,600 per day. Okay. But there are 24 hours in a day. So that's 86,400 immigrants per 25 days. That's a little less than a month. Now we got to figure out how many weeks. There are 6,480 and 800 immigrants per 25 weeks. That's a little over four months. And there are 31,449,600 immigrants per 25 years. Now that's per 25 years. We wanted it per year. So now we actually have to do the numerical um, division here. So it's one, approximately 1.25 million immigrants per year. Okay. Sometimes we're not given um, empirical values. We're not given the values that we use, the metric, the system that we use in the U.S. We're given metric. That's okay. We can still do conversions. The good, the, what I find the best thing about um, metric is you're only dealing with tens to get from kilometers, centimeters, meters. It's all dealing with powers of ten. So the math is fairly easy. It's just moving a decimal here and there. So let's see an example. Volcanic rock on the island of Kauai is approximately 5 million years old. Kauai is 519 kilometers away from Kiawea. I think I said that right. Probably not, though. Uh, the volcano on the island of Hawaii. This means the Pacific plate is moving at 519 kilometers per 500 million years. What is the rate of movement in centimeters each year? So, first of all, uh, we need to figure out how many centimeters in a, in a kilometer. Well, there are a thousand kilometers, there are a thousand meters in a kilometer, and there are a hundred centimeters in one meter. Okay, if you know your prefixes, centi, deci, deca, kilo, hecto, if you know your, your um, prefixes, you'll be able to figure this out fairly easily. It's all in terms of meters because meters measure distance. All right, 519 kilometers per 5 million years. Well, there are a thousand meters in a kilometer. So the kilometers are going to cancel out. There are a hundred centimeters in a meter. The meters will cancel out and I will be left with centimeters. There are, see, make sure I get it right, 51 million 900 thousand centimeters per five million years but we don't want to know every five million years so we do the division and it's 10.38 centimeters per year that's about the same rate as the growth of a fingernail all right so let's try another one Pyroclastic flows, that's the fast-moving gas and ash from an, uh, a volcanic eruption. You've probably seen these on the news. 10 meters per second to 100 meters per second. Could you outrun a pyroclastic flow on foot, on a bicycle, or in a car? Well, less Americans have trouble with figuring out how much a kilometer is. So let's change it over to miles. We want to know how many miles per hour that is. A typical person can run about four miles per hour. You know, me, maybe 3.5 if I'm really out of gallop. Uh, but let's change it over from meters per second over to miles per hour. So if it is 10 meters per second, let's get rid of the seconds and get that over to an hour. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. That means we are going 36,000 meters per hour. 
Now, there are it's one kilometer per thousand meters. I'm trying to get rid of this meters. And then there's one per mile. It's 1.6 kilometers. So the kilometers will cancel out. So I have 36,000 miles per 1,610 hours. That's approximately 22.4 miles per hour. Now the question was, could you outrun a pyroclastic flow on foot? Well, no, even the fastest man on earth can't run 22.4 miles per hour, at least not for a very long time, if he could. Could you do it on a bicycle? Well, maybe. There are folks that can definitely ride their bike 20, 25 miles per hour. You definitely could outrun it in a car. Okay. But that was for a slow-moving pyroclastic flow. It said 10 meters per second to 100 meters per second. So if we did the same conversion to where if it was 100 meter per second, okay, this is a little bit different story, right? 100 meters per second is 223.6 miles per hour. And I'll let you figure out all the conversions. Could you outrun it? No. Could you out bicycle it? No. Could you jump in your normal car? No. You're not getting away from it. Uh, you'd probably have to get in a plane really super fast. So it's pretty amazing that a pyroclastic flow is between 22 and 224 miles per hour generally. That's pretty fast. All right, let's take something that you might be able to grab around your house and figure out. Take any bottle with uh, any vitamins or whatever, and those vitamins will contain so many tablets or pills or, or gummies. Let's say we have a bottle of vitamin C and it contains 50 tablets. Each tablet contains 250 milligrams of vitamin C. I want to know how, much, how many milligrams, how many grams are in the whole entire bottle. First of all, we want to figure out how many gram, how many milligrams per bottle is there? We know how, it, how much it is per tablet, but we don't know how much is in the bottle. So here's how I'm going to do it. 50 tablets per bottle, and there are 250 milligrams per tablet. My tablet unit goes away, and I'm left with 12,500 milligrams per bottle. Now that we know how many milligrams per bottle, I can convert the milligrams over to grams. So there are, for every one gram, there's a thousand milligrams. That's not that hard. Milligrams disappears. I divide by a thousand. I get 12.5 grams per bottle. Now, that's method one. Our second option is to figure out, well, how many grams per tablet, and then multiply the tablet by how many tablets I have in the bottle. Okay, so I don't know how many grams there are per tablet. 250 milligrams per tablet times one gram per thousand milligrams. That will give me 250 grams per thousand tablets, or 0 0.25 grams per tablet. Now that I know how much is in one tablet, I have to multiply it by how many tablets are in a bottle. So there are 50 tablets in a bottle, the tablet goes away, and I am left still with 12.5 grams per bottle. So either way, it's just another way to get to the end point. Do you figure out how much is in the whole entire bottle first, and then convert it to grams, or do you find out how many, how many grams are in one tablet, and multiply by how many tablets are in the bottle itself. Let's try one last example for um, unit analysis. An engine of a car has a 2 liter displacement. Now, if you're not too sure uh, what a 2 liter displacement means, it's just the size of the engine. It's how much space it takes up inside the engine compartment. Liters are not necessarily what you're thinking of, just a 2 liter bottle of soda, like it's Soda. No, liter is volume. 
Okay, so it's a three-dimensional size. Okay, three little three a two-liter bottle of soda is a volume of soda. A two-liter displacement of an engine is the volume of an engine. We know that one inch cubed, because it's three-dimensional, it better be cubed, equals 16.39 milliliters. Our unit we're going with is liter, but we know about milliliters. So we need to translate liters into milliliters and then to inches cubed. Okay, so two liters times a thousand milliliters over one liter, the liters will then cancel out, times our conversion factor of the inches cubed to milliliters. One inch cubed to 16.3 milliliters. Milliliters at that point cancels out. It 2,000 inches cubed, those are the only units left, over 16.3, so it's approximately 122 inches cubed. Scientific notation. We're going to change gears just a little bit and talk about scientific notation. Scientific notation is a number, and it's written in the form n times 10 to the r, where n is 1 is less than or equal to n is less than 10, and r is an integer. Integer, meaning it could be negative and it could be positive. Now, in a previous lecture, we said we never left the, the um, exponent negative. Yes, that's dealing with expressions and polynomials. When we're dealing with scientific notation, it's perfectly fine to leave the exponent in negative form. All right, let's try an example. 376,000, and we want to write it in scientific notation. First of all, it's not in scientific notation. This number is definitely greater than 10. So I need it to be a number between 1 and 10. Well, if I divide by 10 once, I get 37,600. If I divide by 10 again, I get 36, uh, 3,760. If I divide by 10 again, that's going to give me 376. That was three times so far. If I divide by 10 again, I get 37.6. And if I divide by 10 again, I get 3.7. 3.7 is in between 1 and 10. I divided by 10 five times. Therefore, my scientific notation for 376,000 is 3.76 times 10 to the fifth. Now, if we want to go the other way, convert the other way, 4.52 times 10 cubed, and we want to write it in standard form, we say, 4.52 times 10 once, times 10 twice, times 10 three times. Well, 10 cubed is 1,000, so we're really going to multiply 4.52 by 1,000, and therefore we get 4,520. That's one way of looking at it. The other is just move the decimal to the right three places. This number is positive, therefore the decimal goes to the right when you're multiplying it. When you're shrinking it into scientific notation, if you go to the left, it's a positive number. It's a little bit backwards. All right, since negative numbers, we've already talked about this, gives us reciprocals, then we can write very small numbers in scientific notation as well. So, for example, 5.7 times 10 to the negative 4. Well, if we convert this negative... Uh, this 10 to the negative 4 power to a positive power, that would be 1 over 10 to the 4th. And 1 over 10 to the 4th is 1 over 10,000. And if we do this division, we get 5.7 times uh, divided by 10,000. It's going to be 0 0.00057. So let's take a peek at some examples. Numbers in standard form, numbers in scientific. We already did this one. 376,000 will be 3.76 times 10 to the fifth. I needed to move that decimal over five positions for it to be in scientific notation. 
49,500, I'm going to need to move, divide by 10, divide by 10, divide by 10, divide by 10, four times. Therefore, 4.95 times 10 to the fourth. 3,200, divide by 10, divide by 10, divide by 10. That means 3.2 times 10 cubed. 591, decimal sits right here. I'm going to divide by 10, divide by 10. 5.9 is in between 1 and 10, so I'm good there. 5.9 times 10 squared. 46, I only need to divide by 10 once. That's going to be 4.6 times 10 to the first. 8, I don't need to divide anything. 8 is in between 1 and 10, but in scientific notation, we still say 8.0 times 10 to the 0. Remember, anything to the 0 power is 1. 0 0.47, well, that's not between 1 and 10. So I need to multiply it by 10, which is the opposite of division, so it's going to be a negative number. 4.7 times 10 to the negative 1. I'll do one more and I'll let you look at the rest. 0 0.093. This number is definitely not in the um, range of 1 to 10. So I need to multiply by 10 once, decimal sitting right between the 0 and 9. Multiply twice, now it's 9.3. That is in between 1 and 10. Because I multiplied by 10 and not divided by 10, I have to say that it is 9.3 times 10 to the negative 2. All right. Now that's a lot of, what was it positive, when was it negative? If you start with a large number, your, po your exponent is going to be positive. If you, small, if you start with a very small decimal number, if you start with an A decimal number, as in nothing on the whole number side, then your exponent will be negative. Let's do a few examples. Let's multiply 4 times 10 to the 7th times 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Now, first of all, how it's written is a little crazy, right? It's very confusing. I'm going to take my lead values and separate those out. And this old-fashioned x is going to stand in for multiplication. And I'll take my powers of 10 and deal with them separately. 4 times 2 is 8. 10 to the 7 times 10 to the negative 4 is going to be 10 to the 7 minus 4. And the minus comes from being negative, not from it being down below or whatever. That leaves us with 8 times 10 cubed. Dealing with division, we're going to treat it the same way. We're going to separate the numbers. We're going to separate the powers of 10. 9.6 divided by 3 times... 10 to the 12th divided by 10 to the 4th. Using our exponential rules, well, 9.6 divided by 3 is 3.2. And using our exponential rules, that's going to be 10 to the 12th minus 4. In other words, 10 to the 8th. 3.2 times 10 to the 8th. All right, let's see one more. 6.8 times 10 to the 5th times 3.9 times 10 to the negative 7, all over 7.8 times 10 to the negative 4. Again, I'm going to put all my numbers to one side and my uh, powers of 10 to the other. 6.8 times 3.9 all divided by 7.8 will get us 3.4. 10.5 times 10 to the negative, or 10 to the fifth, times 10 to the negative 7th, all divided by 10 to the negative 4. Let's do with the numerator first. 10 to the 5 minus 7 will be negative 2. And bring the 4 up, it becomes positive, leading us 10 to the negative 2 plus 4, and that 3.4 times 10 to the 2nd. If anything, one of the issues that might arise is, when you do your math, what if? What if I got 13.4 times 10 to the second? 
Well, 13.4 is not in between 1 and 10. And because of that, we have to do one more step and put that number in scientific notation. I'd have to divide by 10 once, and therefore it would be 1.34 times 10 cubed. I would have to give one more 10 to all the 10s. One last example for this lecture. The Cone Nebula. The distance across the Cone Nebula is about 2.5 light years. How many miles is 2.5 light years? Well, one light year is approximately 186,000 miles per second. Well, we can convert that to from seconds to years. So I'm going to go from miles I'm going to leave my miles alone. I'm just going to convert my seconds to a year. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. Seconds will cancel, minutes will cancel, hours will cancel, day will cancel, weeks would cancel. The only measurement of time I have left is a year. When you multiply 186,000, times 60, times 60, times 24, times 7, times 52, we get this big humongous number. I don't even want to say it. So let's convert this number over to scientific notation. Let's divide by 10, 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 and keep going, keep counting, and you would count 12. I have to divide by 10 12 times to get this number to look like scientific no notation. It is approximately 5.87 times 10 to the 12 miles per year. Now that's one light year. So let's take that and multiply it by 2.5. 2.5 is a nice number. We're going to multiply 2.5 by the 5.87, and we get 14.7 times 10 to the 12 miles. But 14.7 is not in scientific notation, so I have to divide it by 10, giving one more 10 to the 12. So it's 1.47 times 10 to the 13 miles. All right, that's it for this lecture and this chapter. So until next time, be seeing you.